Good afternoon, and welcome to Split Rock Lighthouse and our annual Edmund Fitzgerald Memorial Beacon Lighting. We'd like to thank you all for attending in person or watching the stream online. It has been 48 years since the Edmund Fitzgerald underwent her final journey across Lake Superior. While the Edmund Fitzgerald is the best known shipwreck on Lake Superior, she is only the most recent to occur with the loss of life. Lake Superior is the largest and most treacherous of the Great Lakes. It contains about 350 wrecks, with about 50 of those in Minnesota waters. It is estimated that as many as 10,000 shipwrecks lie at the bottom of all the Great Lakes. Before we move into our ceremony, we would like to highlight how the tragedy of the sinking of the Edmund Fitzgerald directly impacts the work of the U.S. Coast Guard and the maritime community today. To do this, I would like to introduce Commander Jared DeWitts, Commanding Officer of the U.S. Coast Guard Marine Safety Unit out of Duluth. Commander DeWitts is the Captain of the Port and the Officer in Charge of Marine Inspections for the Western Lake Superior Tri-State Area. Well, good evening and thank you, Director. It is a pleasure and an honor to be here today. This is an amazing turnout. I am, I'm floored. This is fantastic. Um, this is the first time the Coast Guard has participated in this event. And I just want to recognize the folks here on the stairs. They represent most of the units here in Duluth. There's the AIDS to Navigation Team. There's the Marine Safety Unit. There's the Coast Guard Cutter Spar and the Coast Guard Station Duluth here with us today. So 22 or so of our folks, please round of applause. So the weather today is pretty, pretty favorable for the middle of November, but I wanna take us back to 1975. For those that don't know, two days prior, the National Weather Service indicated a storm was developing over the Oklahoma Panhandle that predicted a typical November storm that would pass just south of Lake Superior on the evening of the 10th. It was no typical storm, as we soon found out. Only 17 miles from Whitefish Bay, the winds were reportedly as high as 66 miles an hour. Bl uh, blinding snowfall that limited visibility, ships were rolling and pitching through a barrage of 25-foot icy waves. The ship's master, Captain McSorley, with over 40 years of sea time, having captained nine different Lakers, hailed over the radio shortly before losing communications. I have a bad list. Lost both radars. And am taking heavy seas over the deck, one of the worst seas I've ever been in. This was no typical storm. It is important to note that these Lakers were built to handle any conditions the lake would throw at them. From the design thickness of steel, to the detailed stability calculations, to the well-trained and seasoned sailors that navigate on and around. But when a series of independent failures align at the same time, you get what we call the Swiss cheese effect. And that's when casualties occur. Immediately following the major loss, like the big fits, the Coast Guard forms a Marine Board of Investigation to collect facts and evidence, determine the cause, and ultimately make recommendations to the Commandant on how to prevent future occurrences. The FITS investigation uncovered many safety concerns, but I wanted to quickly capture some elements of then and now. In terms of life-saving, while experienced mariners take up positions on the watch quarter station bill, the thought of emergencies were not at the forefront in 1975. Oftentimes, training on launching and operations of life-saving equipment was not even done. It's hard to believe that adequate in-water protective equipment was not required. Now, when crews sign aboard, they are issued individual immersion suits and abandoned ships are done routinely, probably at nauseum if you ask any of the crew members. But they are prepared. It's hard to believe that the FITS did not have a depth sounder installed on board. 1975 NOAA charts did not have very good shoaling indicators. And once a ship lost communication and presumably sank, there was no way for anyone to know for sure. The Arthur M. Anderson's crew, heavily involved in the efforts to valiantly guide the FITS, could not confirm her status, uh, and this likely caused delay in the response efforts. With all that said, the technology has now allowed our ships to have real-time electronic charting, 
that is accurate up to centimeters with alarms and signals for grounding and collision avoidance. They also carry electronic position indicating devices that will float free automatically uh, to rapidly assist with immediate notification and search and rescue. Lastly, it is well known that a major contributing factor to the sinking of the FITS is the loss of buoyancy resulting from massive flooding in its cargo holds. The watertight envelope of a ship is critical to combat seas washing across the decks. Over time, the steel experiences wastage or damage that can compromise this. Nowadays, these ships are thoroughly inspected and require uh, to have high level alarms and cargo holds inside their cargo holds as well as the ability to remove that water. The work my team continues to do in our shipyards alongside our shipyard workers and our operators keep this Swiss cheese from ever aligning again. Just last winter, our senior inspector discovered serious wastage around the hatch combings of a ship that was in the winter layup, and it was eerily similar to the fits. Eliminating one unsafe condition can prevent a catastrophic failure. So, as we stand here today, nearly 50 years after, after the tragic loss of the big fits, this casualty became a beacon of change to improve maritime safety standards for our Great Lakes mariners and ships upon which they sail so that they can contribute to continue to safely move steel and grain and ultimately preserve our national security. With that, I'd like to post the Coast Guard colors. On behalf of, of the Minnesota Historical Society and everyone that enjoys all the lake has to offer, I would like to thank you, Commander DeWitts, and your entire Coast Guard team for what you do to keep the Great Lakes safe. <clears throat> now, as we gather to remember the crew of the Fitzgerald, I'd like to take a moment to explain the tradition of the muster of the last watch. The muster is a traditional nautical ceremony of remembrance to honor the lost crewmen while lost at sea, including the ringing of a ship's bell. Traditionally, if the crew was lost while the vessel was underway, the ship's bell was rung when the, crew, when the lost crewman's watch was mustered, and his name was called for the first time following his loss. The ringing of the bell took place of the crewman answering aye aye, so, the, so his place in the watch was not lost. When a vessel and all hands are lost, such as the Edmund Fitzgerald on this day, 48 years ago, the ceremony is performed for the entire crew, usually ashore. It is referred to as the muster of the last watch, and it honors the crew by name. To this, we have added a 30th and final toll for all the lost sailors on the Great Lakes and the lighting of the decommissioned Split Rock Lighthouse beacon at the conclusion of the muster of the last watch. We will precede the muster of the last watch with the singing of the Navy hymn by Paul Waterman, Roger Reinert, Devani O'Brien, Aaron Blazovic and Aaron Blazovic. After the beacon is lit, the lighthouse will reopen and remain open until 6 p.m. Before we do this, I would like to invite Roger Reinert to explain the tradition of the Navy hymn. Thank you, Hayes. Again, with me today are Paul, Aaron, and Devaney. We come together once a year to form the Lighthouse Quartet and have been doing that for over a decade now and it's our honor to participate in this solemn memorial. The hymn we are about to sing is Eternal Father Strong to Save. It was written in 1860 by William Whiting. Whiting grew up near the ocean on the coast of England and at the age of 35 felt his life had been spared when a violent storm nearly claimed the ship he was traveling on. This instilled for him a belief in God's command over the rage and the calm of the sea. Years later, he was approached by a student about to travel to the United States who confided in him an overwhelming fear of the ocean voyage. Whiting shared his experiences of the ocean and sub subsequently wrote this hymn to anchor his faith. The hymn is traditionally associated with seafarers in the maritime services. Multiple armed services have adopted the hymn to include the United States Navy. Accordingly, it is also commonly referred to as the Navy Hymn and is sung at the end of every service in the Naval Academy Chapel. 
the hymn has a long tradition in the civilian maritime context as well and is regularly invoked by ship's chaplains and sung during services on ocean crossings. Eternal Father, strong to save, whose arm hath bound the restless wind, who bids the mighty ocean deep its own appointed limits keep. Oh, hear us when we cry to thee, for those in peril on the sea. O Savior, whose almighty word the winds and waves submissive heard, who walkest on the foaming deep and calm amid the storm did sleep. Oh, hear us when we cry to thee for those in peril on the sea. O oh, sacred spirit who didst brood upon the chaos dark and rude, who bathed its angry tumult cease, and gavest light and life and peace. O oh, hear us when we cry to thee for those in peril on the sea. O oh, Trinity of love and power, our brethren shield in danger's hour from rock and tempest, fire and foe, protect them wheresoe'er they go. Thus evermore shall rise to thee glad hymns of praise from land and sea. Amen. We will now muster the last watch of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Michael E. Armagos, third mate. Frederick J. Beecher, porter. Thomas Benson, oiler. Edward E. Binden, first assistant engineer. Thomas D. Borgeson, A.B. Maintenance Man. <coughs> Oliver J. Champeau, Third Assistant Engineer. <coughs> Nolan F. Church, Porter. <coughs> Ransom E. Cundy, Watchman. Thomas E. Edwards, second assistant engineer. <coughs> Russell G. Haskell, second assistant engineer. <coughs> George J. Hall, chief engineer.
Bruce L. Hudson, deckhand. Alan G. Coleman, second cook. Gordon F. McClellan, wiper. Joseph W. Maisie, special maintenance man. John H. McCarthy, first mate. Captain Ernest M. McSorley, master. Eugene W. O'Brien, wheelsman. Carl A. Peckel, watchman. John J. Povich, wheelsman. James A. Pratt, second mate. Robert C. Rafferty, steward. Paul M. Rippa, deckhand. John D. Simmons, wheelsman. William J. Spangler, watchman. Mark A. Thomas, deckhand. Ralph G. Walton, oiler. David E. Weiss, cadet. Blaine H. Wilhelm, oiler. We'll have a final toll for all those lost sailors on the Great Lakes.
Thank mm-hmm. you.